Good morning, and once again, welcome to all who are with us today. I want to welcome you for our study this morning. Uh, you may notice that there's a few changes as you look at the presentation. That's because I've changed up my system a little bit, uh, have a new camera and some other things as well. And But nevertheless, we will continue with our studies as we have in the past. Hopefully, this will improve uh, uh, the appearance of this particular study from time to time as far as details go and so on. Uh, but anyways, uh, that's enough of that. On to the lesson at hand. You know, I realize that today, uh, that is the 17th of, of April this year, is described by many in the religious world as a day uh, that many gather together to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And certainly that is something we find all throughout the Word of God. I have often emphasized that the resurrection is it, it, it is at the foundation of our hope. You establish the resurrection and you establish everything you need to establish to understand uh, what it means to be pleasing to God and how to become a child of God. It all centers around the fact that Jesus died and that he arose from the dead. Nevertheless, uh, what we are doing when we come together is what we would do each and every first day of the week. And as always, as I've said, if you are in our area, we do invite you to come and be with us as we gather together to worship God, as we would do each and every week. And, and as always, it's my hope that if you're listening to this lesson, that you are not using it as a replacement for gathering together with the saints where you are at. Nevertheless, the lesson is beneficial if it is true to God's Word. And so with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started with our study for today. We are continuing to deal with the subject of the grace of God, and this, of course, is a part of our theme for 2022, which is drawing closer to God. And over the course of the past few lessons in this study, we've actually dealt with the grace of God. And I think that this is an important subject. As a matter of fact, in my last lesson, I announced two more lessons. Well, uh, there's going to be three more lessons because as I continue to study this particular topic, uh, it, it is so rich and so meaningful, and, and I think it is something that we need to think about and grasp a little more. So I'm going to present another lesson beyond this one dealing with the grace of God, and then after that, we will deal with how do we respond to the grace of God. Of course, what we've talked about thus far in our study, in this particular study, is we've talked about what grace actually is and described it as God's part where salvation is concerned. Uh, also, we have described it as uh, uh, that which we do not deserve. Uh, it is the prime factor where our salvation is concerned. We've talked about how grace can be abused. And in our last lesson, we talked about how amazing God's grace is by looking at some examples of those whom God forgave in spite of the, the seriousness of their sins. And with that, I hope that we can look at our lives and, and realize that no matter what we have done, God can forgive us of our sins if we will but repent and turn to him or return to him uh, uh, whatever the need might be. But what I want to deal with in this particular lesson is I want to uh, start to look at what God's grace can do for us. We're basically going to notice some things beyond that of salvation. Now, one of the observations I want to make as I get started, though, is, is, is I want us to take a look real quick at the book of Acts in particular. And I, and I want you to notice um, that you find passages that show that God's grace was something that was clearly evident uh, in the lives of brethren and churches back in the first century. And I believe that that is equally true today. In other words, if the grace of God is present, or, or if, if the grace of God is present in your life, it's going to be something that's going to be manifested in the way that you conduct yourself. And, and, and you're going to know it's there. Uh, in Acts chapter 4 and in verse number 33, we read there, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. We read about how, uh, how uh, there, the great grace of God was, was there. And it was working in their midst. In Acts chapter 11 and in verse number 23, here we find uh, the, the apostles and others have heard that 
that Gentiles are, are receiving the Holy Spirit and, and Gentiles are, are obeying the gospel. And so Barnabas is sent to Antioch to investigate exactly what is going on. And when he arrives in Antioch, we believe there, or, or we read there in Acts chapter 11 and in verse number 23, where the point is made there, when he had came and seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all with one that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. He saw that the grace of God was at work amongst the Gentiles. And of course, remember that just prior to this, Peter goes to Cornelius, the first Gentile convert as recorded in Scripture. Paul and Barnabas, a little later, will go on, uh, on uh, Paul's first preaching journey. And you find in Acts chapter 14 that they are in uh, what would have been described as Asia Minor, and they're in a town of Iconium. And we find as they are there, it we read in Acts chapter 14 and in verse number 3, Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. <clears throat> so we find as they were preaching, the grace of God was evident. The grace of God was clearly manifest. I also find another example where Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's making reference to, to godly brethren in Macedonia. And this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And you read there in verse number 1, where Paul says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And then he proceeds to describe how even in their great poverty, they wanted to give to needy brethren in Judea. And even though it was something that they could not afford, they found a way to help in that particular work. And Paul is encouraging the brethren at Corinth to do the same thing in verse 6. Uh, so we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. And the point is, uh, the point is, is these brethren appreciated all that God had done for them. They realized the abundance of God's grace as they looked at their salvation and everything that was involved. And, and they showed, if you will, grace to others as a result of that. It was demonstrated in their lives. So you just find a few examples here of the fact that, uh, and that uh, like I said, as you look at these examples, you find here that God's grace, uh, when it is working, it, it's evident. And understand that we're living in a time where we do not have miracles like they did in the first century. But that does not mean that we cannot see God's grace in our lives. He is doing his part. And that is his grace. And as a result of what he has done and our gratitude toward that, we do our part toward him. So we find it's demonstrated in others, and I'll have a whole lot more to say about that in a couple of weeks when we deal about with our response to the grace of God. But for the remainder of my time in this lesson, I want us to turn over to the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 1 and beginning in verse number 3, we find this passage of scripture that describes numerous blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And I want us to take a few moments and I want us to consider these blessings and see how these blessings, they all demonstrate the grace of God. And I'm going to pick out a few things that are we actually find in these verses. We begin by reading the text where Paul there says in uh, Ephesians 1 and in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us acceptable in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he pur pur purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, 
he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should also be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in which you also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So here in this verse, we find that, that Paul begins this particular text by noting how every spiritual blessing is found in him, in Christ Jesus. And you know, when you talk about the grace of God, you talk about what God has done. You talk about God's part where our salvation is concerned. And friends, that's exactly what you find in Ephesians chapter 1 and beginning in verse number 3. And so we want to uh, talk about our salvation for a few moments. Now we've noted a couple of texts as we've gone through this study already that emphasize the importance of grace. You know, over in Titus chapter 1 and in verse number 11, Paul there said, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul there says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And we've, um, we've developed that verse a little bit uh, in, in past lessons, but the point is made there. It is by the grace of God that we have salvation. And so as we look at this text, we find the grace of God abundantly at work. As a matter of fact, the term grace is actually mentioned two times in this text, and I think there are some other descriptive phrases that could easily be substituted for the word grace or describing the grace of God. So let's get started with this text and notice some things that he says in this particular text here. And the first thing that I want to notice is that by the grace of God, I am chosen. In verse 3, uh, verses 4 and 5 of this text, where Paul says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. You find in this text, he talks about the fact that he chose us in him. And of course, the him that he's talking about is Christ Jesus. And when you have that word predestined in verse number five, and you also find it a little later on in this text, it's a word that means that there is something that is predetermined ahead of time. Now, as I understand predestination, it is not teaching that God has randomly selected who will be saved and who will not be saved, and, and, and basically you have no control whatsoever. That is contrary to so many teachings that we find in Scripture, including the fact that salvation is made available to everybody. God desires all men everywhere to be saved. If God has randomly picked people to be saved, and incidentally that's the, the, the foundation of, of the full system of Calvinism, then that means we have no choice in it whatsoever. That takes away our free will. And that takes away the fact that God wants everybody to be saved. So what does predestined mean if it's a term that means to be predetermined? My understanding is it's talking about what I would describe maybe as a mold. The idea is before the foundation of the world, God determined what man was going to have to do to be saved. And everybody who conforms to that mold or that pattern that he has established can be saved. Or let me rephrase that, will be saved if you conform to the mold. So when you read there in verse number four that he has chosen us in him, Jesus came and did his part, and God has chosen that those who are in him, that they will have 
salvation, that, that, that they will, will receive the grace of God where salvation is concerned. And so that's what you have in that day of chosen in him. And when I see this fact that by the grace of God I am chosen, the idea is God has made the mold and I can conform to that mold by submitting to his will. And another way of saying that, I, I actually belong to him. I belong to him because I have conformed to his mold. Something else that we read, though, we also read that by God's grace, I am holy and I am blameless. As you read there in verse number four, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be homeless or holy and without blame before him in love. He made the point there that we are holy and we've talked about holiness quite a bit in recent lessons where uh, where we've just emphasized the idea that what that means is that we are set apart. We belong to God. And we need to act different than the rest of the world because we are holy. God said, be holy for I am holy over there in uh, 1 Peter and chapter 1. He expects us to strive for holiness in our lives. And the point is, is because Jesus died on a cross... He paid the price that was necessary to take care of my sins. And that's going to come up again and again as we go through this particular text. He paid the price where we are concerned. You read over there in Romans chapter 5 and beginning in verse 6. When we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died to purify us. Jesus died to make it possible for us to be holy so that we could stand in the presence of God. You find the same thing over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul begins to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. And the point he makes there in that text, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. Jesus died for us. And thus we have the opportunity to be holy and pure in God's sight. And the bottom line is, is I am free from the bondage or the slavery of sin, if you will. Over in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse number 1, Paul there says, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again in a yoke of bondage. We have been made free because of the blood of Jesus. And thus we are holy as we stand before him. The same thing is over in Romans chapter 6, where he talks about you are... Uh, 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 where he makes the point there in verse 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were, obeyed, uh, that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We are right with God because we have been set free from our sins. So, I, I, by God's grace, I can stand before God because my sins have been taken care of. I have been made blameless, and I can be holy, and thus I can be in the presence of God. But furthermore, as we continue in our text, by the grace of God, I am adopted. I am adopted in verse number 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself. You know, the idea of being adopted means that you are added to a family. A family by grace has chosen to take you into their household, into their family, and, and to treat you as if you belonged to them. One of the ways that we are described as Christians is we are the family of God. When we obey the gospel, we become his children. God is our heavenly Father. In Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 19, you read there, now, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household 
of God. Uh, we're part of God's family. I like the way John said it over in uh, 1 John chapter 3. And where you read in that text the first couple of verses, John there says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Notice how he makes the point, we are children of God. And he makes a point, what, what manner of love the, bother, the Father has bestowed upon us, in that he has made us his children. Because of the grace of God, I'm part of his family. I have been adopted into his family. Because of the grace of God, I am accepted in the beloved. I am accepted in him. And it's interesting to think about this in verse number 6 of our text, where we read there that Paul says, To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us acceptable or accepted in the beloved. Now, of course, the beloved is another reference to Jesus. And, and notice how as we go through this text in so many of these descriptions, Jesus is mentioned as the one who makes it possible. Well, remember how Jesus was described as the beloved. As he was baptized and comes up out of the water, the Spirit descends from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3.17. Or, or on the um, Mount of Transfiguration, as it is called, where Jesus with Peter, James, and John went up to the mountain and he was transfigured, transformed, if you will. And you see Elijah and Moses there. And then a voice comes out of heaven as Peter is wanting to make tabernacles for all three of them. And you read there, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Over in Colossians chapter 1, and sometimes the book of Colossians is, is described as a companion to the book of Ephesians. There's a lot of parallels between them. And that shows that Paul is writing to different congregations and he's got the same message. Uh, but in Colossians 1 and in verse 13, you read there in that text, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Notice how he describes Jesus as the, the son of his love. Now I want you to think about this. Jesus is the beloved, and because of Jesus, I'm accepted by God. When it comes to my sins, I'm an outcast. I'm separated from God. I am on the outside. But because of Jesus, I am no longer an outcast. I am allowed access because of Christ. And, and there's examples that Jesus gives in some of his parables. Over in Matthew 25, you have the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. And you have the bridegroom coming. And those who were prepared entered in with the bridegroom. And then the gates were shut. So they were let in. They were accepted. And sometimes when I think about accepted, that's what comes to my mind. You go to a place and you're only allowed in if you have an invitation. We are accepted by God because of Jesus Christ. He is going to let me in. What a blessing it is to give consideration to that fact. That I have been accepted by him. Well, let's continue. We find also... That by the grace of God, I am redeemed. I am redeemed through his blood. In verse number 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I have been redeemed through his blood. Now, the idea of redemption is a price that is paid to purchase someone's freedom. So you have the idea of Jesus coming to the cross, and because he died on the cross, he paid the price that was necessary to free us from the enslavement and the consequences of sin. Over in Hebrews chapter 2, and in verse number 15, Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse number 15, we read there in that text, it says, 
uh, in verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. When you are in Satan, you are in bondage to sin. Again, you go over to Romans chapter 6 that we read uh, just a few moments ago. And you notice in verse number 16 that uh, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of uh, obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You were in bondage to Satan, but no more. You have been set free from that bondage by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. By his grace, I am redeemed. And of course, the idea of redemption, as I said, uh, the price has been paid. Over in Romans chapter 3, where you read in verse number 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, we all need God's glory being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Or over in Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse number 12, where you read in that text, the Hebrew writer tells us, uh, verse 11, Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of bulls and goats, or not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. It's redemption once for all. Through the blood of Jesus I am redeemed. And incidentally, by God's grace he accepted his blood, and that means that when I sin I don't have to go slaughter an animal. What a blessing that is when we think about our the grace of God and, and what we've received because of that. Well, let's go back to our text again, and you find that as, that, that as Paul continues, he makes the point that not only have we been redeemed, but he says we have the redemption of sins according to the riches of his grace. We have the forgiveness of sin. Because of sin, I'm guilty. I've done wrong against God. And possibly others, and may, you know, maybe I've sinned against myself as well. The wages of sin is death. Uh, Romans 6, 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, and, and, and in verse number 23. But by the grace of God, through the blood of Jesus, I have been forgiven of my sins. Over in 1 John chapter 1. And in verse number seven, and I know that this is a text that's dealing with the child of God. Even as a child of God, when I sin, I can be forgiven of that sin. And the, and, and the idea that forgiveness is described here in verse seven, where you read, uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see how these verses, a lot of them are just tied together and they, they, they complement each other with the various descriptions. So you find by the grace of God, I am forgiven. And what a blessing that is to give consideration to that. Furthermore, by the grace of God, I have been made aware. Turn over to our text in Ephesians 1 and verses 8 and 9. You read there where it talks about according to the riches of his grace, we've received forgiveness. And he says, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in him, both which are in heaven and which are on and which are on earth. So he made to abandon us all wisdom and prudence, and he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, uh, 
which he purposed in himself. God has made known to us what we need to know. To know. Because of the grace of God, I have wisdom. I have understanding, which is what's associated with the word prudence, as it is used there in the New King James Version. So, so, so you have the idea. As I, I know what I need to do. Because of the grace of God, he has revealed to me who I am. And I'm going to talk more about this in our next lesson. But also, uh, I can know what I am, and I can know, uh, and, and I have what I need to know. God has revealed to me everything that I need to know. And friends, one thing I want us to realize is that we can know that we are in him if we are following his word. I want you to turn over to 1 John for a moment. And there's a number of passages where John uses this word know. And the idea that he's emphasizing there is we can know. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Now, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Uh, we, we can know and, and the way we know we're pleasing to God is when we're doing what he tells us to do. And that's emphasized throughout. 1 John. In 1 John 3 and verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. We know that we have life. In 1 John 4 and verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. 1 John 5 and in verse 13, the things I have written to you uh, who believe um, in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Paul, uh, John, I've written these things so you can know you have eternal life. Friends, by the grace of God, he's made it possible for me to know how to approach him. And it is found through his word. And there's a lot to be said about his word and grace but continuing in our text by the grace of god i am united in christ again we read in verse number 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him and you have the idea of all things are going to be united together and the point is, is we are no longer separated. One of, one of the points that Paul wants to make in the Ephesian letter is that Jesus didn't just die for the Jews. He died for all mankind. As a matter of fact, what Jesus did resulted in salvation being made available to everyone. I'm no longer separated from God because of Jesus Christ. I'm united with Christ, and when I'm united with Christ... I'm united with the Father as well. And incidentally, I also need to be united with my brethren when I'm united with Christ. And I think that's one of the points that Paul is emphasizing in this particular statement. You go a little further into the book of Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4, and beginning in verse 1, he actually talks about our need for unity. I beseech you to walk worthy with the, with the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he talks about that unity in verse 4, where he says, There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And the point that is made in that text is you have all these ones, and it means one and only one. So it's descriptive of un unity. There's one Lord and one God, one spirit, one faith, one way of belief. In Jesus, we have these ones. I want you to notice just prior to his death, in John chapter 17, as he is praying to the Father, and beginning in verse number 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. 
So the point that is made there is he prays that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Friends, we are united in Christ. We're no longer separated from God. We're, uh, by his grace, he's done what is necessary to unite us, to bring us together, to bring us into Christ and in Christ to bring us to him. And I, as I've said there, to do that together. That's what he has as a desire for us. And so you find that there, that all things are brought together in him. We are united in Christ by the grace of God. By the grace of God, I have an inheritance. I have a reason to live the way that I need to live. There is a hope of a, of a greater reward when this life is over. You read there in verse 11, In him we have also obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. You may recall that as Jesus was speaking to his apostles in John 14, he told them that I, I'm going to leave, but, uh, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Basically, so that I can receive you to myself. We have hope of something better when this life is over. And friends, that's why we live the way we do. We need to constantly remind ourselves of that. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse number 4. 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse number 4. You read there, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. We have an inheritance. Writing to the, the brethren at Colossae, in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 12, Paul said, You give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And in chapter 3, and he's talking about servants submitting to their masters. And among the things he reminds them of, he says that whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. There's an inheritance that's waiting for every one of us. It, isn't that why we strive to continue to serve God the way that we do? We have a hope of something better when this life is over. We're seeking that reward. And by the grace of God, he has made that reward available to us. By the grace of God, I can trust in him. Going back to our text, you read in verses 11 and 12, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, and he goes on in verse 12, that we who first trusted in him should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in which also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He makes the point that you first trusted in Christ and, and you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. And I see in that not only did we trust him in becoming children of God, and you know, over in Romans chapter 10 and verses 9 and 10, where you read, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, when you describe what is involved in faith and in believing in God, it involves the idea of trust. We have to trust God. We have to believe what he tells us enough that we do what he tells us to do, and we believe that he's going to do for us what he said he would do. And even as children of God, we continue to trust him. So we, we trust him leading to our salvation by his grace, and we continue to trust him as his children. You know, I, I remember what Jesus said over in Matthew 11, and beginning in verse 28, where he said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is emphasizing that you come to me and I will give you rest. I will take care of you. 
We have that trust by the grace of God. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 9, Paul said, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. Because of the grace of God, because of what he has done, I trust him. And I continue to trust him in my life. You know, over in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, this is where Paul tells Timothy to command the, the rich not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. You've got to learn to trust God. And by God's grace, I can trust him. And finally, by the grace of God, I am sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And again, going back to our text, where the point is made, the fact that uh, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And the point that is being made here is the Holy Spirit was given to us. And, and the idea of being sealed is the fact that he is a guarantee. Now, what exactly is guaranteed? And I believe it is the fact that God keeps his word. God has done and revealed to us everything that is necessary so that we have reason to trust him and to hope him. We can believe him. We can believe that God keeps his word. And friends, when I see the idea of, of, the, uh, of the, the Holy Spirit of promise, I, I see the idea that this hope that I have is a real hope. You know, over in the book of Romans in chapter 8, where Paul deals with the Holy Spirit, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. He makes the point when we're walking according to the Spirit, there's no condemnation. We're living the way that we ought to. The Holy Spirit has made it possible for us to know how to do that. In verses 5 and 6, those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We need to walk and live according to the Spirit. God has given us the Spirit by His grace. He did not leave us alone. Even when Christ went back to heaven, He gave us that which can guide us and continue to guide us. Now understand, this hope doesn't need to be miraculous. And if you study the scriptures, you will learn that we are not living in a time of miracles. The, the, the days of miracles are gone. They are past. They were a part of the first century. But when his completed word came into existence or, or was completed, we no longer needed the spiritual gifts. We have the completed word of God. And his word guides us. You may recall that as Jesus was speaking to his apostles over in John chapter 14 and in John 16, he's about to die and he says, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you alone. When I leave you, I will send the helper, the Holy Spirit, and he will bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you in, in uh, John 14 and in verse 26. He will remind you of everything I said. Chapter 16 and in verse 13, I still have many things to say to you. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. As you study the word of God, one of the things that you learn in scripture is the word of God is the product of the Holy Spirit. For example, over in Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 17, as Paul is describing our armor, he says, you take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Or over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and in verse number 13. And you read in that particular text there, where Paul says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, 
comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Paul's saying, what I'm revealing to you is the message of the Holy Spirit. And he develops that further throughout 1 Corinthians, actually the first three or four chapters. In pretty great detail, he emphasizes the work of the Spirit. And again, I'll deal more with that in a, uh, uh, next week uh, in our next lesson as we talk about God's Word uh, is a product of His grace. And the point, as Paul is making here in our text, as he talks about all these blessings, is we have everything we need to know that we are in him. And what a blessing it is. And friends, thus I can see that as we look at, as we look at Ephesians chapter 1, we can there see the grace of God all throughout that text we can see everything in him we have redemption forgiveness of sins we are chosen we have an inheritance we are a part of his family we even uh, we even have his word to continue to guide us and 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 to let us know that we're right with him among other things let us never forget that friends the grace of god is amazing do you appreciate fully what that grace actually means. Think about that, and if you would, please bow with me at this time. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, once again we come to you, and we do want to thank you for your marvelous grace. We know that as we study your word, and as we look at the spiritual blessings that we enjoy through Jesus Christ, that we see the manifest evidence of your grace. And we have a hope beyond this life because of your grace. Help us, dear God, to live our lives with that appreciation and help us to do what we can to show that grace in our lives and to strive to share it with others and bring them to you so that they too might have that grace. Go with us through this day and in all things help us to put our trust in you. We ask this in Jesus' name and in amen. And, amen. and again, Thank you for listening to this lesson, and as is always the case, I hope there was something of benefit in this particular text. I, I just encourage you to read through that text again and, and just ask yourself the question, by the grace of God, I am, and then just look at everything that is there because of what God has done for us. Think about that and let that build you up as you live with a world that so often wants to tear you down spiritually. So thank you, and, and I commend the lesson to you, and have a good day.